they're not as strained, they're more nuanced in this country because of some of the liberties that we all have. Uh, but we do want to, inshallah ta'ala, we want to focus on three essential questions that I'd like for you to uh, try to help me answer, right? I'm not claiming that I have answers, I don't have answers. But I do want to broach this topic because I do think that as uh, the conversation of Islam expands, that we have to talk about the taboo subjects. So we want to hear from you, really. This is not something where I'm here to teach. We want to hear from you, inshallah ta'ala, the sisters as well as the brothers. So we want to focus on three essential questions. First question, inshallah ta'ala. Gotta click again. Thank you. Is feminism a legitimate subject in Islam? Why or why not? Right? So, in discussing this, the topic of feminism, this is a topic that's fairly new, this, this definition, right? Feminism is something that came up during women's suffrage in the uh, 60s into the 70s with equal pay um, and, and issues of, of equal, each, equal equity in the social construct of the American landscape. But it has become a, a, a topic of discussion within Islam. And there's two, there's kind of two different narratives. There's the narrative of honor killings, right? There's the narrative of female genital, genitalia, uh, uh, the, the, what is it called? Mutilation, that's the word. There's the issue of lack of education. But those are not the issues that we find in this country, right? The issues that we find in these, this country has to do more with equity, right? And we'll explain the difference between equality and equity. So the issues in this country have to do with more of what does an expression of equity of women in Islam look like? So I just want to open up the floor and start with that general introduction. And I'll be giving two more questions, then we'll create some context from some some of the ulama, some of the classical ulama, as well as today's ulama, and then we'll try to step back and see if that sparks any more thoughts. So is feminism legit? Why or why not? Don't be scared. <laughs> so we'll give you a minute to think about it, inshallah ta'ala, but we want some feedback. So what is feminism? What is feminism? Let's define it. What is it? Let's come up with a collective definition of it. What do we think? It's many different things, right? I've been, I've been in conversation with many different feminists, male and female, and each one of them has a different definition of what feminism is. Is that my mic Yeah, that might be it, the feedback from the two mics. No, it's not at all. So, don't be shy. We want to think about it, inshallah, on time. Sisters, any feedback on what feminism, what feminism legit? We've been having some microphone issues. Literally that. Maybe that did it. Okay, we're better. So what is feminism? And is it, and is it a part in, uh, part of Islam? Why or why not? I don't want to hear myself speak, so we'll give you some time to think. No one has ever had this conversation. No one wants to define what feminism is. No one wants to take a shot on at it. No one wants to see, talk about whether it's legit or not. Yeah, okay. This is the issue that we've been having is that there's no Feminism is having a, a microphone available for the sisters. That's part of it, inshallah. 
So brothers, inshallah ta'ala, I don't want to have to call you out by name or description, so please participate, inshallah. So we do have a microphone available. And we want to keep the conversation fluid. So please, we, wanna, we, we don't want to monopolize the floor. One person speak, allow time for someone to step in and step out for someone else to, to give some rebuttal. Thank you. Silence is good. It's not uncomfortable. It's okay sometimes. Is women alive? I'm sorry? Women or rights? Women rights. Women's rights. Women okay, rights. good. That's a nice broad definition. Women's rights. The equality of sex. The equality of the sexes. Alhamdulillah. Good. Now we're defining terms. Excellent. Anything else? But well, sisters, we don't want the brothers to define what feminism is for you. So please, feel free to speak up. feminists in the room. Raise your hand if you consider yourself a feminist. And this is not someone who has to be a female, they're a male feminist as well. Any feminists in the room? I think if you explain the literal meanings of feminism, that would help many. I so, okay, Sheikh, so no one knows? I, I think, uh, in the literal sense, so, generally we know, there are the paper, there are the news, feminism, feminism, in the literal okay. sense. Uh, that's all, that's it. Okay, I'll do that. But before I do that, raise your hand if you don't know what feminism is. Okay, so so what I find what I find perplexing is that this has become such a topic in Islam that we should all know what it is. And I think that it, it, the nuance in the definition is that it's there there are many different definitions. I don't want to define it. I'd rather one of the sisters define it in Shalom Tyler. Sister, you want to give it a shot? It's working. It's working? There we go. Um, well, as you said, feminism is something that belongs to a kind of historical tradition, in, uh, especially in the West. It's a Western phenomenon. And. Um, <laughs> You know, I'm someone who, you know, whose life probably looks like a feminist life. You know, people say that I'm a feminist in a way. I mean, I should call myself a feminist, um, but I, I don't. Uh, and I don't think that it, it belongs in, it's not that, that, it's not that it doesn't belong in Islam, but it's not the same thing as what Islam has to offer. It's a different, it's a different paradigm. And it does, it is about uh, equality for women. And what that usually means is economic equality. It could mean a lot of other things, but I find that the, the feminism of the sort of secular West is, um, it's been boiled down to that. And that's a shame. It's not a well-rounded sort of um, philosophy or approach. I don't know what to call it exactly. So, um, and it's changed all the time. So you know, how do you define feminism within an Islamic construct? Well, I don't, like I said, as a Muslim, I don't, I, I don't even know that it's necessary for us to, to uh, call ourselves feminists. Mm, mm. Um, and I don't know that it's, that we should even be uh, sort of lowering ourselves to to decide whether or not we're feminist. I think we're just using another paradigm to define ourselves when Islam really has all of the things that the original feminism uh, started out wanting. Like? Like, uh, like equality in a holistic way, right? Um, I, don't, you know, I don't want to work as a Muslim. I don't want economic equality necessarily uh, with my brothers, you know, I don't want to go out. I don't want to have to work 
um, as hard as they do. I don't want the focus of my life to be there. Um, but, but in order to call myself a feminist in the other paradigm, I, that's something that I would strive to do. So I, I just don't think it's appropriate, really, for Muslim women to worry about whether or not they're feminists. I think they should concentrate on what they do have. I mean, the system of Islam is, it has everything to make Muslims happy, you know, Muslim women happy. It's, it's already there. Um, okay, so but maybe that's too radical to you know sort of too radical to start out. Maybe that's not really where you wanted to go. But no, that's fine. That's um, why I wanted you to speak your mind and heart. That's fine. But we do have a rebuttal. Hold that thought. Yes. But I think Islam has a different perspective of feminism, and the West has a different perspective of feminism. Okay. The West is hypocritic. This what? Hypocritic. Hypocritic. Okay. Hypocritical. Hypocrite. Okay. Because they are using this word to befool the woman, basically. Yeah. They're using the word to trick the trick. Yes, they're using it as a trick. Yeah. Okay. And Islam is giving it the right perspective as it should be. Okay. This is my view. Okay. And so yeah, what I'm hearing now is that feminism is outside of an Islamic framework, but there's no dichotomy between the two. There's no, no there's Islam, no conflict. Islam is I think Islam is more feminist. Than the West, Masha. because it, may, it, it, it it favors the woman more than what the West is doing. Okay. Like they just uh, they have a slogan for feminism, but they are not really giving the women uh, her uh, real rights. Got it. Okay. Real rights. Yeah. Which are what? What would we say the real rights are? This for anyone. The woman should. Woman has got a different physiology, and the male has got a different physiology, mm -hmm. and they are trying to work out. Uh, putting the load of a man on a woman. Put the Why she, when they, they want to get work, equal work out of the woman. Yeah. They are work not for that. Got it. It's just like uh, you are using a car as a truck. Mm -hmm. Okay. A truck is meant for taking load, but a mm -hmm. car is not meant for taking that. Mm -hmm. So he gives the example of, for those who didn't hear. He said, to, to, and this is the issue we want to talk about, Shane. Jazakallah khair to both of you for being brave enough to talk about it. It's equity versus equality. So equality says, I need to get somewhere, right? But I have a load with me. Equality says that, hey, we're both, a truck is equal to a car. So load the car up with everything you need it. Equity says, no, if I have a load, I need a truck. I can't take it in a car, right? So equality says, everyone in the room gets a pair of sneakers. Size eight, that's equality. Everyone gets a size eight. Equity says no. You get a size 11, you get a size nine, you get a size 10 according to what you need, according to your particular size. Absolutely. Right, so you're saying, alhamdulillah, you said it so articulately, so articulately that Islam is more about equity and justice than just being equal all across the board. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. So the next question, inshallah, because this is what I'm hearing in the message and what I'm hearing on the college campuses of the future Muslim leaders is that there needs to be space for women, and we spoke a little bit about this before, to lead prayer, give khutbah, pray beside men instead of in back of men, to have equal prayer space, to be able to have their own massage, and these type of things. So this leads me to my second question, inshallah. Have Muslim women demanded too much? Or have Muslim men given too little? Explain why or why not. Do you think Muslim women are asking for too much to ask for to be able to pray next to men instead of behind? Because they feel like praying behind is demeaning. Now, I'm not going to give any if to, I'm not going to talk about the rulings, the 50 principles. If you know them, highlight them, bring them up. But we're just talking about the basic invocation that we need to pray behind, we need to pray next to them with men instead of behind them. We should be able to get khutbah. We should be able to lead salah. We should be able to have our own equal prayer space. Where's the, where's the resistance here? Where's the tension? Are, are Muslim men not opening up enough areas 
or are Muslim women looking at the wrong areas to focus on? And I'll give you a second to think. These are not easy. The basic issue is that the women who are demanding this kind of putting up this kind of questions, mostly they haven't understood Islam. They haven't understood Islam. And same is the case with the men who are throwing out such sort of things. Okay, so they don't know what Islam is. Actually, the issue is that nobody is going into Islam. They're just seeing it superficially uh -huh. and getting to that. And whatever the media says and whatever the people out of Islam are saying, we're just carrying on that. So do we agree with that? Or he's saying that basically when you have this argument, it's because you, you misunderstood Islam. When you don't have a complete picture, you're looking at all the superficialities. But some people would say that's a. Some people would disagree with that and say that's the, that's the issue. Is that when I bring up these things, you tell me I don't understand Islam, when in fact I do understand Islam. I didn't get your question, but you can. Bismillah, wassalam, wassalam, wassalam. See, first of all, brother, those people who say that we do understand Islam and we demand those things, I think they're fooling themselves. They're tricking themselves. Simply because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly states in the Quran, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نَعْمَتِي وَرَضِيْتُ لَكُمْ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينَ Meaning, today, I completed for you your religion and perfected uh, my blessing upon you. And Islam, I am satisfied that it's your religion. Now, if this thing is to happen, and if there was any good in this thing, then the Prophet ﷺ would be the first one to lead the Prophet. Aisha radiallahu anha wa would be the first woman to lead, you know, the, 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 the people in, in the khutbahs or the, the prayers. She would be the first woman to pray next to the Prophet ﷺ among the men. But you see, they misunderstand or they heed this about what Islam, what Islam means, you see. Those are called acts of worship. Acts of worship must be, and again, must be, and there's a million line under must be, performed as were performed by the Prophet ﷺ, because they are acts of worship. We have no power or authority to change those things. It's like saying someone, okay, uh, let's, let's not pray the duhr for rak'ahs. Let's do them two rak'ahs because let's make things easy on us. Now, who gave you that authority? Now when someone says, okay, let's men, let the woman pray next to the man. First of all, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes laws for mankind, he makes those laws, laws for the uh, people with sick hearts as well as people with sound hearts. Mm -hmm. Now, do you guarantee your wife when she sits or when she stands next to someone in prayer that that person has a sound heart? Who guarantees that? Nobody. And do you guarantee that a shaitan will not try to affect your prayer here next to a, a, a sister, say, you know, a woman? No one guarantees that. In other words, those things are going to take your mind off your prayer. You came here to do an act of worship. Okay? The other thing is, when the Prophet Sallallahu separated men from women, now, he didn't do that, you know, for that just, you know, out of, let's separate them, men, women are less than men. No, they're not. And I would say Islam is the only religion who makes women in worships as equal as men. Islam is the only religion who honor men. And as a matter of fact, our Prophet said in the hadith, خيركم خيركم لأهلي وأنا خيركم لأهلي meaning the best of you is the one who is good to his family and I am the best of my family and when when the word أهل is said in the Arabic language it particularly means the wife okay so he was considering the wife that's one thing the other thing scholars they have a debate about if you touch a woman do you still more than your what or not so if that woman is, you know, next to you, you're going to be touching her. Mm -hmm. And again, scholars, they have an issue. Mm -hmm. 
Now, Shafi says immediately you would lose wudu. Immediately. So how could you perform prayer? Um, I didn't mean to take the whole thing. No, I'm not sure. That's good. I just wanted to speak my mind. And again, the bottom line is this. Al-Khutbah, when the Khutbah, yes. leading the Salah, those are acts of worship. And the acts of worship must be performed as we were taught by our Prophet Sallallahu because our Prophet, if he would have hidden one little thing from us, as if he did not, you know, inform us of any of the religion. That's what Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says in the Quran. Ya ayya Rasul, bagir ma uhi ilaykim rabbik wa illam taf'al fama badakht al-salata meaning, O you messenger of Allah, inform what was revealed to you from Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. And if he did not do in one single case, as if you have not done anything. So, if there was any good of the woman to give prayers, or to do khutbas, or to stand next to men in the salah, our prophet would have been the first one on earth to do that. Mm. That's what I wanted. Alhamdulillah. Barakallahu Good. Alhamdulillah. Ashi Yuka speaking up. Alhamdulillah. Yes, my brother. Yeah. So looking at the two questions, uh, women, are women demanding too much or have men given too little? I think, so based on the current scenario uh, where our ummah is, I, I have no, I have very less uh, knowledge about, you know, the hadiths or all of that stuff, but, but only, this, this answer is only based on the current, current situation of the ummah. So I feel both of these are related to each other. It's more of men stopping women from doing things that they should they are allowed they should be doing mm. that what their rights are and because of that i feel women are more getting get demanding stuff which they, which they should not be doing mm. so in order to find that equality which you mentioned uh they're not given the equity because of which they are looking for equality mm. is what i feel uh, so I think it's it's more the first question is more of a re repercussion of the of the second yeah. being not provided to them. Mm. Inshallah. So let me ask you a question. This goes to the third question, but let me ask you a question. I'll open it up. Inshallah. Ta'ala. So would it be disagreeing with prophetic tradition to give Muslim women everything they ask for? So what I mean by that is if we're holding them back from things that are halal for them. First, I'd like to know what do you think those things are? And then, to give them those things, would it be disagreeing with any prophetic tradition? And we can open that up, inshallah. So what, what are some of the things that we've been holding women back from doing, do you think? Yeah. Just being objective here. So, and then, Shay, I want to hear from you. Yeah. Definitely. So I, I go back to where I come from. Yes. Uh, from the subcontinent area where uh, there are a lot of things that the women have been hold that not been provided. Firstly, the rights to speak up and be be in a part of discussion. To so when a decision is made, the decision is solely based off of a discussion from the male of a family. Mm. What kind of discussion? Any discussion? Any 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 discussion? Any decision that needs to be made? Women are seldom made part of of that discussion and okay. made a part of that decision. That needs to be opened up a little. Uh, second is the education aspect that I really stress on uh, for the fact that women, so first the initial stress is given on education, education, educating the male child, whereas we, we feel back home is, is there's no sense in educating a woman because in the, that's by the end of the day she's getting married and going back to the, to the, to the, to the in law family. So that's what they should stress on. So I mean I don't say it's the mentality of everyone. But a whole, a, a larger perspective, larger uh, group of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if, if they are not being provided or given that right, um, in order to find equality, then yes, uh, women would definitely go on to things that asking for things that are not in perspective. To answer your question, to give women everything they ask for, well, I feel not so. So here, here, so what I feel here comes uh, the, the the education side or or the knowledge side from the women aspect as well. If if they know they are bounded, they wouldn't be asking something which is 
beyond the boundaries of mm -hmm. what Islamically that needs to be that they need to be having, in the sense that demanding uh, demanding to give khutbahs or leading the prayers mm -hmm. that that's outside yeah. what 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 should be asked mm -hmm. for. But yeah, I mean, if it's asking for things like you know equal education, saying having a say. In, 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 in everything, like issues that, in issues that affect the affect the affect the family, affect the uh, country, or affect affect right. the ummah. So yeah, that's what I feel. Yeah. Great statements. One second, Shay. I just want to check on the sisters if they need to have any statements. Yes, please. I think uh, the Muslim community is very strong in the sense that they want to have a Violating the rights that they were given to them, and that is why women have been now demanding things which are beyond the boundaries of the world. And I think the pain is somewhere else, and the women are seeking medication for some other illness. It's not going to solve any issue. So their demands are actually um, they're, they're baseless. They won't help solve the issue of the which we are fighting for today as equal rights. Or it's not even equal rights, basically what you mentioned. We need justice in the system the Islamic families uh, and Islamic society. So I think this is all the Jazakallah <laughs> khair, sister. Anyone else? Uh, yes, I know, to you over there. Yes. What I'm seeing as it is, uh, is correct in the perspective of the society. It, it's there in the society, the way he has explained. It's same in India, same in Pakistan. Right? But it's not in Islam. Mm. It's not related to Islam. It's related to our society. Mm. Okay? Islam doesn't say this, what our society is doing. But some Muslims are doing that. You think? Most of the men are doing that. Most of the Muslims are doing it. I mean, if there are uh, something like 200 million uh, Muslims living in Pakistan, the affluent class is hardly 10 million, and the rest 190 million, they are living below the poverty line. And that is a predominant population. Okay? And there, the woman has no rights. Exactly. Similarly, I have given it. But that has nothing to do with Islam. Right. Exactly. Rashallah. Thank you, Sheikh. Please. So again, brother, um, it seems that those people, like, you know, trying to blow Islam out of perspective. You see, what is the definition of Islam? When you say a Muslim, what does that mean? Islam is submitting you to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala paid. All your acts, all your deeds, all your intentions, everything, you submit that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our Prophet said in the hadith, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يكون هواء تبع لما جئتم به منه No one is a believer unless his desires, his whims, we call it whatever, is to follow what I came with. And also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says clearly in the Quran, إن كنتم تحبون الله فاتبعوني يحبكم الله ويخلقكم الله. Meaning, say, O Muhammad, say, if you truly love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then follow me. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love you. So again, those people who are calling to this, look in the sunnah, look for in the tradition of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa not only the Prophet, the companions, the khulafa, the four guided khalifas, the, the, the sahaba, the companions, look in their body. <coughs> Have you ever heard or read or learned that in their, in their time, they, uh, the people were, uh, a woman was leading a salah, or a woman was in a khutbah. That's one thing. Another thing, I'm going to set an example um, just to show when you believe in Allah, what does that mean? Okay? When you submit to what Allah, what does it mean? The example uh, about, let's say, last week, yeah, exactly last week, the night of Monday, last Monday. Why is the, why is the memory of an Islam Which is, you know, the night journey of the Prophet وسلم, from Al Masjid al Haram to Al Masjid al Aqsa, then the ascension to the heavens. Now, the faith of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu gave us an example is when you believe in a Prophet, then anything that he sees is to you, reason, it could happen. 
when Quraysh came to the Prophet and they were trying to make fun of them, fun of them and said, okay, was anything revealed to you tonight? And he started saying about the journey, the night journey, and he did not mention the Mi'raj first, the ascension, because he knew if he would have mentioned that, they're gonna, nobody's gonna believe him. So he started telling them about the, the journey, and they tried to make benefit of this, and they thought if we go to Abu Bakr and tell them that Muhammad said so, and Abu Bakr disbelieved him, then we're home free. Allah, no one will believe in Muhammad anymore. That's it. So what they did, they went to his house and they used to call him Atif. And they said, Oh Atif, come out. So he came out. And he and they would say, Did you hear what your brother or the, 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 the brother of the Arabs said? And he said, What did he say? He said, He claimed that he was taken. Uh, a night journey from the Al Masjid Haram to Al Masjid Al Aqsa overnight. He came, he went and came back. That's where the faith comes. That's when Abu Bakr Allah, said, I believe him in something that is more than this. I believe that he gets revelation from the sky. So, what is this journey? That's nothing. He said, Abu Bakr said, and that was the slogan of Abu Bakr. If he said it, then he is truthful. He said it. And then he went. Our Prophet at the time, he was, he felt so down. Because a lot of Muslims, they converted. I mean, what are you talking about? If you imagine yourself at that time, probably we won't believe it as well. But now because we believe in the Prophet, we know it happened. But let's imagine ourselves at that time, so we can appreciate the faith of Abu Bakr. So he came to him and he said, Is it true, O oh brother of ours, what the people say about you? And he said, What did they say? He said, They said that you were taken in a night journey from the Masjid al Haram to the Masjid al He said, And what did you tell them? He said, I told them if he said it, then he is truthful. He said, Yes. So he said, I bear witness that you are the truth, the honest. And that's when got the Prophet yeah, yeah. you know, gave him the name Asr. So again, faith is to believe with what the Prophet said or did. Now when those people ask, all right, again, let's have the woman lead the prayers, let's have them. I don't think I, I, I can't say they have no idea about Islam. I don't think they understand the true Islam about these issues. Jazakallah khair, Shaykh. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair. I know, I know people here. What time is this, Isha? 9.30. Okay, good. We got, we'll go for another 10, 15 minutes, inshallah. Next slide. So now we're going to look at a statement, inshallah, ta'ala, of some of the ulama. So Imam Shafi'i, and this just kind of reinforces what we've been speaking about, but it kind of puts it in perspective. He says, there are no politics except that which corresponds with the law. Next slide. Ibn Qayyum. Oh, I'm sorry, the sister has a statement to make. I'm sorry, we'll wait. Yes. Now, could you turn the mic on? It's not on. He commented on the statement of Shafi'i, he says, 
If when you say accept that which corresponds with the law, you mean that which does not run against what the law has addressed, then you are correct. Next slide. But if you mean there are no politics except what the law has addressed, then you are wrong and that is incorrect. So when Imam Shafi'i says there are no politics except that which corresponds with the law, he's saying that if things occur and they correspond with the law, that is sound. But if you're saying there's nothing except the law and there's no exceptions outside of the law, this is not correct. Next slide. Why? Next slide. Ibn al-Qayyim, he says, because when the signs of justice appear, by whatever means it may be, then you will find the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his deen. So what Ibn al-Qayyim is saying that there's elasticity in Islam, that even if Islam does not address something directly, then if that thing comes up and, it's, and it's, there's justice in it and there's equity in it, then this is the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as long as it does not go against the sharia or the sunnah. Is the microphone ready? Okay, we'll stop it and listen to the system, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. So I just, um, I wanted to say that um, in, in my understanding of, um, um, in, my, in my understanding of the law, um, there is no question to me that these demands goes beyond the bounds of the set by Allah. Um, but I also realize that this is not a theoretical question, it's not a social question. Um, it, it's more of a social reaction to, um, to what is going on um, in the world, to what is going on in the world. And I don't know if she was just a theoretical question, I wish it was a question that we could solve by just you know, um, talking about theology. Um, but it's, it's a social reaction to um, the injustices um, you know, that exist in the UMA. It's, it's a reaction to the denial of rights that are within the bounds that we set by our And so when those rights are denied, then, um, then there's a reaction that sits of, of, of things that are not um, allowed by um, whatever. And there's also a, a sense in which um, when, um, when injustice is being done, when the rights are um, you know, when the rights of women are denied, there is no outrage. In the woman, there is no support um, you know, from even men who are not involved um, you know, in the denial of the injustices. But when there are these demands for what is not within the point, there's this outrage, this, this, you know, this, this reaction. Um, and then the other comment that I wanted to um, make is... Can I stop for a second? Because I just want to make sure that we all heard and understand. You're saying that when the rights of women are suppressed, or that when they're, when they're usurped by men, there's no outrage. There's no outrage. But when women, desert, when women um, demand which is, that which is outside of the deen, then there's outrage, there's outrage from men. Yes. So there should be equal outrage when the rights of women are suppressed. Yes. Okay, just have no help, please continue. Yes, um, I'm just looking at that. It's, this is really, as I said, it's really um, a question that begins from the family. So what kinds of songs are we producing in the families? What kinds of examples are we setting for our children? How do we treat our songs? Um, you know, um, versus how we treat our daughters? Um, and there's so, um, from Nigeria originally, and there's this, this recognition, um, this form of recognition that um, we have we have created um, sort of a culture within the Puma um, where we have you know where, where we have, have not produced a lot of these songs who so, so have neither true knowledge of the team um, and neither are many of them you know very responsible um, right and so so there's you know but then there's this you know there's at the same time this insistence on their right without you know real knowledge and also without you know um, sort of real ability um, those sort of socio-economic um, you know, um, ability. And so, so there's, so it's, it's quite a social problem, but it's really something that starts, you know, within the family. And to that extent, it's not just a problem with men, it's also maybe a problem with women. Okay? So how do we, um, how do we think about that? Jazakallahu so, khayyib, mm. sister. Very excellent points. And I believe the final point was saying like these, what are we teaching our children in the household? How are we, what, how are we framing this, this narrative so that they, they're able to understand some of the tensions as they grow up and they can, they can address them accordingly. Alhamdulillah. So, with that statement in mind, inshallah ta'ala, Ibn Qayyim is saying that justice is the hallmark of Sharia. Justice is the hallmark of Islamic law. Next slide. Why is this principle important? Next slide. Because God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is too wise and too aware to restrict justice and its signs to just one thing. And he's too equitable to reject something that may be more evident than one thing. 
And Sheikh Muhammad al Khan al Nadawi, he said this in his book, Muhaditha. I recommend everyone get this book, Muhaditha. And he also says to give a framing of some of the issues that women face and the rebuttal from men. He says, next slide, inshallah ta'ala, that one of the main challenges Islam faces is the following. Women say, if men can do X, why can't women do X? And really, the Orientalists say this, the, uh, the, everyone outside of Islam has this argument. If men can do X, why can't women do X? X equals, why can't they interpret the law? Why can't women get fatwa? Why can't women lead salah? This argument embarrasses Islam because it frames each argument as one of equality and not equity. I.e., if men can do X and women can, or if women must do X and men don't, don't have to do X, then men must be viewed as superior to women. Although, in the book Muhaditha, there are examples of 8,000 female scholars issuing fatwa, interpreting Quran, teaching men, challenging judges, etc. There still needs to be clarification of defining equity in Islam between genders because this answer is insufficient. So what, what this means is to say that, well, there are, women can be scholars too. Even though it's good, it's not good enough. As Sheikh Muhammad Khan al Nadwi points out, he says, The question I have that eyes. He says the question is never reversed. As if to say, if women can do X, why can't men? It is taken as given that the traditional domain of a woman is inferior. That somehow running a home, raising children, that these are menial chores because they are either unpaid or they are not prestigious. And as a result, Women assume they must take hold of economic independence or political power as a means to the objective of acknowledgement and or self-sufficiency. A balance, as the Sheikh he says, would be in the fact that if a woman, like all 8,000 Muhaditha, if she had the inclination towards knowledge or entrepreneurship, then so be it, but not at the expense of the demoralizing anything else in Islam. All 8,000 women, these ulama, they held their households together, even while they were knowledgeable. So the question is framed to misleadingly give agency to what one can do and not what one can be. As the Sheikh says, more important is what you can be and not what you can do. A, a, a result, as a result, I'm sorry, because the, uh, the projection is a little off. As a result, Feminism is characterized by resistance and how many can-dos are won over from the exclusivity of men. So feminism is framed as we want to do everything men can do. Resistance, as opposed to what the sheikh says that what makes more sense is what you can be. He says, he gives the example of Aisha. He said the balance would be if you look at Aisha. She fought the Muslims in battle and she failed. But then she went back to Basra and she began to teach, and men flocked to seek knowledge from her in the end. So she failed in what she was able to do, which was fight the Muslims, but she was able to be a scholar and overcome that by being empowering herself with what she was able to be. So it's not just about what you can do. The Sheikh, he says, the, the question forces women to reject traditional signs of compliance to the rules of Islam. So women who want to have this resistance, they have to feel as though they have to remove hijab. They, they don't want to get married. They abandon the ibadah, the, the worship. And as a result, young girls are taught a subversive form of feminism that leads to their religious demise. And this goes back to what our sister was saying, that feminism is built in Islam, and we should not begin to lower ourselves to think that this is something separate from Islam. Rather, Islam, if feminism was already built in Islam, it's only when the Western world, when, when, when there was a, uh, when the, the achievement gap or the opportunity gap was made known between men and women in the Western society, that women came up with this title called feminism. But we know that the Prophet so said was in, in, employed by his wife, right? He was employed by his wife, who was an entrepreneur. The first martyr, the first shahada, the first woman to start a school in Islam, were uh, the first people to do these things were women. 
No. The difference between equity and justice, the real issue between men and women in Islam, in diversity and inclusion, what men and women are focused on is still missing the mark. So what we're saying is that what's in red is no good. What's in red is no good, and what's in green is what we need. Diversity and inclusion is just a band-aid. Next slide. The Muslim issue is more about equity and justice rather than diversity and inclusion. Because equity and justice requires a longer historical look at systematic, systemic issues. Whereas diversity and inclusion, it tends to be a quick fix, fix and an appeasement. And this clearly explains the difference. So we got a few questions, inshallah, and they will be done. So, diversity in red, not what we want. This is usually what's asked in the masjid. Diversity asks, who's in the room? Equity responds. Instead of asking who's in the room, we should be asking who's trying to get in the room but can't. Whose presence in the room is under constant threat of eraser? So that means that a lot of times brothers will say this, and I've seen this in many messages. You have a board who's made up of all one ethnic group. So they say, we need more women and we need more minorities. So get a black person and get a woman, get a sister, put her on the board. And so the next question, inclusion in red, that which we don't need, it says, has everyone's ideas been heard? But justice says, whose ideas won't be taken as seriously because they aren't in the majority? So they say, Brother Tiwala, you're black. What do you think on the board? So I'm sitting on the board with 13 other people who are not like me. Brother Tiwala, you're black. What do you think? I tell them what I think, and they say, that's nice. Thank you. We included your voice. Next. Sister, what do you think? She's on the board with 12, 13 men. Sister, what do you think? Well, this is what I think. That's nice. Next. So it's not about just hearing voices. It's about whose voice will not be taken seriously because they're not the majority. Next. Diversity asks, how many more? You can pick any minoritized identity. How many more of that group do we have this year than last year? So we have 10 more women participating in the message. We only have five last year. But Equity says, what conditions have we created that maintain certain groups as a perpetual, perpetual majority here? Different questions. Next, inclusion asks, is this environment safe for everyone to feel like they belong? But justice says, whose safety is being sacrificed and minimized to allow others to be comfortable maintaining dehumanizing views? Wait one second, wait. So what we're saying is this. Inclusion is just about saying, does everyone feel safe? Let's move on. But what's really important is what kind of environment is being created where we even have to ask this question. Who's feeling as though they're being dehumanized? And we can say that in the, in the message, the brothers categorize all the women as saying, you have your own space. You have your own food. When we serve food, you have your own food. But we have one dimensional view of them. When really this is dehumanizing them. We're not saying that they have to lead Salah. None of the sisters here said that they wanted to lead Salah. But what's happening is that we are looking, overlooking the, the itch, issues that dehumanize them and not making them real human beings. And we only become outraged when the issue has to do with them trying to step on the toes of what has been exclusive to men. Please, thank you. Inclusion, that which we don't need, says, wouldn't it be a great program to have a panel debate about women's rights in Islam? So we had a female Muslim scholar and activist here last year. So this year, we should invite a female scholar who comes of you. So we had a female scholar who fought for women's rights. This year, let's have a female scholar who thinks that women's rights are necessary in Islam. But the correct view is that of justice, which asks, why would we allow the humanity and dignity of people to be the subject of debate or the target of harassment and hate speech? So what that means is, why is it even an issue whether or not women have certain rights? It's a fact that women are marginalized, even within Islam. Some women are marginalized even in their own houses. Even in their own houses. 
We're not saying that women got to leave so hot or they got to get cooked or they got to pray in the same line as men. But what we are saying is that we have the opportunity and the luxury to look at the way that women have been marginalized and placed in a box by us here in America, by men who think that we're just, that we're full of just and equity, justice and equity. Next slide. So we conclude by saying diversity celebrates increases in numbers, but these numbers still reflect minoritized status in misogyny and incremental growth. Next. Equity instead, this is what we want, it celebrates reductions in harm, revisions to abusive systems, and increases in support for people's life, for people's life chances, as reported by those who have been marginalized. So we can't sit in the room as brothers and say, how do we do better for sisters? Sisters have to define what they need, and we have to support them in that. Inclusion celebrates awards for initiatives and credits itself for having a diverse prayer line. But instead, justice, what we want, it celebrates getting rid of practices and policies that are having disparate effects and impacts on minoritized groups. So what are we doing in the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are affecting our sisters in a subversive way? These are the questions that need to be asked. And in asking these questions, we cannot say that it takes away from our masculinity. Many people feel as though to, to, to focus on what the sisters need somehow takes away from masculinity. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was the most masculine out of all of us. No one was as brave or masculine or had as much machizo, machismo as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he took advice from women. He was concerned with women. He would cry in public. So this is not a question of masculinity, rather it's a question of what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want from us that would allow us to do better. And we conclude by saying a truly democratic shared Islamic space, it must be, it must not be ideologically neutral. It can't be, rather. It must ardently pursue the preparation of Muslims for engaged citizenship in an ostensibly democratic society. And the first step on that road, however, is to make equity and justice the yardstick by which leaders measure progress instead of merely diversity and inclusion. So not just having the numbers, but having the voice and giving credence to that voice and that opinion is how we, inshallah ta'ala, we, we raise the bar up and allow our sisters to feel that they have a platform. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Jazakumullahu khairan. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdik. Asha'ahu wa la ilaha 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 wa ratu ilayk. Jazakumullahu khairan.